well, boys. Looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? Cunt. What are you talking about? I just, we haven't said that enough yet this year. Cunt, fuck, and there is no God. You are uh, listening to Double Feature. And uh, my name is Eric, and your name is Michael. My name is Michael. I have a raspberry goddamn tea made by the Arizona Tea Company. <laughs> it costs uh, about a dollar. I believe it says great buy, 99 cents on the side of it. And that makes us completely ready for today's show. Uh huh. As ready as we could ever be for today's show. So we have two movies on the show today. We what do. are the movies? Uh, we're going to do Hairspray and Little Shop of Horrors. And, of course, The Rain to keep us company. If it's bugging you, try listening without headphones, maybe. I don't know. All right, so let me see if I got this. Okay. These are films that are the original versions that were later made into musicals. Right. Uh, Broadway musicals. Uh-huh. Are they both Broadway? I believe they are both Broadway. Broadway musicals. And then came back around and were adapted into films. Right. The Broadway musicals were adapted into films, so it's not a direct line to original and remake. Interesting. There's, there's a step outside into Tony territory, and then... <laughs> and then comes back around into remake. Well, maybe not even remake if they're adaptations of adaptations. Difficult, it's difficult to call it like it is, but what, what I do know is that of the two filmmakers we're going to talk about today, John Waters and Roger Corman respectively, mm-hmm. only one of them maintained the rights to their project. The other one kind of got fucked. Yeah, he's Roger Corman sold the rights to Little Shop of Horrors um, because he he's a he's a money thinker and mm-hmm. he's always just you know the kind of guy that looks to make money and doesn't want to worry about he doesn't want to worry about making less money at one point right. and eventually earning money and he didn't really see potential for <laughs> sure. a musical. It was probably an accident. Who has any goddamn idea? We're gonna spoil both of these movies. Hairspray is going to go first. It's the John Waters film. Right. And the Roger Corman film is The Little Shop of Horrors, which will go second. These are low on the spoiler territory. However, they are, like all pieces of art, highly spoilable. Right. And we're going to do our best. If you don't want to get spoiled, you can use the chapters. Go up to where it says chapters on your QuickTime dealie. No one listens to this in QuickTime. No. You're listening on an iPod right now. Yeah. That's where everyone probably listens to this. Yeah. Or in their car, but then attached to their iPod. They're using the music app on their phone to listen to this. Uh, somewhere in there, there's a chapter menu, unless your music player thing sucks and doesn't support chapters. <laughs> totally fine. Use the lyrics section then, or go to the website. Go all the way to the website to figure out where you need to be skipping to. So, uh, last week on the show, you promised not a musical. I did. I and, promised uh, a musical. And there is a lot of goddamn music in there's Hairspray. A ton of, and the, there's a lot of dancing. Anybody <laughs> right. looking at this at first glance... May say musical. May say musical. And I say nay. Wow. But uh, I want to talk about the musical for about five seconds. Okay. It was made by... I want to see if you recognize this. This is going to be an obscure one. It's going to be very hard for you. Okay. Especially given that musicals, not something we cover. Uh-huh. Not covering musicals, something we cover. Musicals, not something we cover. Got it. Still along for the ride. Mark Shaman. Mark Shaman. Name sounds familiar. Did the Hairspray musical. Also did something we've had on the show. Okay. South Park the movie. Huh. Yeah. He's the guy who wrote a lot of the music with Matt and Trey. How about that? For South Park. Okay. In the original Hairspray, the one mm-hmm. we're talking about today, John Waters not only directs, but as usual, uh, wrote the film. And as, as well. unusual cameos. Yeah. That's, uh, that's definitely a bizarre <laughs> thing. You know, John Waters is a hypnotherapist in this uh, movie. Yeah. In the strictest sense of, I mean, he's He's got a hypnotizing pole and a cattle prod. A a hypnotizing pole is what you would call that? It's some kind of pinwheel thing, right? Yeah. People don't know what we're talking about. Unless they watch the movie. Of course, they watch the movie. They know exactly what we're talking about. He's chasing uh, Penny Penny around with this, this fucking, it's really, it's a 50s lollipop Uh of a hypnotizing thing. And later with some sort of uh, space probe. Electric space probe. So on the John Waters map that we have uh, 
Uh, and, I mean, we started at the end, and then we kind of went earlier, and uh-huh. then we, we moved around a lot. We have covered a lot of his stuff. We have. We started with The Dirty Shame. Yep. Which was late. Uh, most recent film. It is his most recent film. After A Dirty Shame, we did Polyester. Uh-huh. That's the, earlier. The smell of vision film. Sure. Right? And then we covered Serial Mom as and, well. And Pecker. And Pecker. Um, when we did Look and Pecker. Serial Mom we did with To Die For. Mm-hmm. Actually, sorry, we covered Pecker before Serial Mom, but everybody else. Yeah. So when we're looking at Hairspray, this puts us, you know, it's been seven years since Polyester, which is actually the longest uh, longest gap between any John Waters films, uh, huh. sadly, with the exception of now, if there, you know, will be another John Waters film. Right. That's sad. Yeah, A Dirty thought, Shame 2004. I thought, Crazy, that was, right? I thought that was more recent than that. That's horrible. Yeah, no. Uh, John Waters has been doing a lot of other stuff. Uh-huh. Um, he was just in Chicago at our beloved music box. By Sands. just in Chicago, you mean last year? Well, I mean, that's the last I mean, this is the last time, time he was flies. in Chicago. But yeah, he was at our beloved music box, Sands MC. He was introducing The Wizard of Oz here in mm-hmm. Chicago, which is a film that was highly influential to, yeah. to him. I believe he cited the line, uh, All My Wonderful Evil Destroyed by Such Innocence or something like that. There's some line in there that made his film career. But you don't know the line? I forgot it. I've, I haven't seen Wizard of Double Oz. Double feature. Not a place to learn. Not a place to learn new Google things. Google it. Uh, thank you. Once again, let's just rely on Google. Let's not bullshit anybody here. Just use Google. Now you know there's something that inspired John Waters at some point. And it has point. something to do with beautiful evil. That's yeah, in That's form. enough to... All we're going to give you is enough information for you to type something into Google. Right. The rest of this podcast will be presented in short form where we say every third word of our sentences. Which is great. It's like we're giving people seven hours of information right. in a 45-minute episode. Brilliant. Beautiful. We're absolutely goddamn motherfucking geniuses. All right. So seven years since Polyester, but before Serial Mom came okay. out, which was the next one. It's a, it's a film that was made, uh, released in 1988. Right. But takes place uh, early 60s. 1962, I think we finally right. settled well, on. Well, then 63 is the auto show, right? Right. And while we're talking about a cast that includes John Waters himself, <laughs> um, and the later scenes, I mean, are really the best John yeah. Waters moments. Yeah, they are. I don't know if he cameos in any of his other I movies. Don't think just, I, I, again, I, off the top of my head, once again, yeah. use Google, right? Can't think of anything. This is the last movie that, uh, Includes, but uh, let's say not stars. Right. Divine. Um, Although Divine has a dual role. That's true. There's a lot of Divine in this movie, but most of the other movies previous to this... Mm -hmm. Divine is on the front cover. Yeah, it's it's about uh, Divine's character. And you also get Divine dancing in this movie, which is something that I'm glad was captured on film. Yep, that uh, needed to happen. Before he died. So he's playing both Tracy's mom Uh and then uh, the the station CEO of the TV station, right? Station manager. That's it. Uh, He played a a male role in a previous John Waters film. I want to say it was Female Trouble, but this is the last John Waters film that he was ever in. Huh? And uh, it was his second to last film. He did a a little horror movie after this, and that was it. So every time we talk John Waters, it seems like there has to be some kind of gag about the beginning of the mainstream films or the end of the mainstream films. Right. But this was, you know, you really want to draw some lines in the sand here. This was the end of the Divine movies. Yeah. And everything after this is, uh, you know, feels a lot different because yeah, it does. of that. You know, it's kind of a bittersweet thing, but the movies have built uh, an amazing cast of characters uh, from one to another to another. So by this time, you know, when he's ready to make another movie, mm-hmm. he still has a bunch of actors who, Mink Stoll, and Mink I mean, Stoll. Uh, even Ricky Lake coming back for the next film for Crybaby, right. uh, just these actors that are now kind of John Waters actors, uh, more people who you can still see a movie and go, this is a John Waters movie, even without the presence mm-hmm. of Divine. But then there's other actors who, so what's weird is in the opening credits, we get a bunch of actors listed where every time they say a name, I say, what? Are you getting a Lost Highway flashback? Yeah, that <laughs> Do you happens. remember the opening yeah, credits of I that? Do. Yeah, it was insane enough, the highway itself, mm-hmm. and how that whole, uh, the, the composition of that whole sequence, but the names that would fly at you, and you would think someone's fucking with you. Right. It's and kind of the same thing. So they have names like this, but then at the end of it, then they list the cameos, yep. and it's Rick Okasek and the girl from Santa Claus Conquers the Martians. Um, Pia Zadora, I think. Okay. She plays the beatnik. Right on. Yeah, which and is he a, plays the painter. A super, super weird scene. Yeah. 
that stands out uh, very much from all of the other fun, crazy stuff right. happening in the film. Yeah. It's kind of the one moment where we're looking down on the culture that's being yeah. so celebrated everywhere else. Right. You know, this whole time, it's the young kids sort of making fun of the older generations. That are so 50s. <laughs> for being several years behind the times. We see the adults trying to get in on, mm-hmm. on some of the kids' fun. Uh, there's also the the tension of the different mindsets there. But then we see this beatnik generation making fun of what the kids are right. doing. And it's suddenly, I mean, it's brief and it's toward the end, but it's just, it's this very smart little... Uh, jab. Yeah, jab at that culture. Just to kind of remind you... That that's not the only culture that's going on in the early sure, 60s. Sure, That there's more than just this crazy, fun, bouffant, hairdo, dance generation. Right, right, because counterculture seems like one culture counter to another right. culture. When, in fact, there are other subcultures who all can quarrel amongst themselves. Yeah. There's, you know, these different divisions of people who think that all of the other ones are ridiculous. Right. Kind of forces you to examine your own, you know, your own breed of counterculture. Right. Well, and and that's another reason that I think it's great that Debbie Harry and Sonny Bono are in yeah. this film. <laughs> right, right. Because they're both, I mean, they're both music juggernauts. Yeah. Especially... In the 80s, more so Debbie Harry than Sonny Bono. Yeah, well, in the 80s. Debbie Harry, aside from uh, seeing movies with Penn Jillette, right. was in Blondie, which right. is the second most notable thing that she's done. First being lesbian and spun? No, no, I was going to stick with Penn Jillette's pseudo girlfriend. Oh, okay. But yeah, spun, totally fine on that front. Um, yeah, we saw her uh, earlier in uh, the history of the show. I was yeah. going to say earlier this year, but God, no, that was fucking was while. years ago at this point. When we paired it with Requiem. Yeah, Requiem for a Dream and Spun. Um, and then we have Sonny Bono, uh, famous for the uh, music pair Sonny and Cher. Right. Um, and they both play parents that are hip, hip parents. Right. That are kind of into the dance generation. Sure, sure. Which is just great because it... it because it's both, Debbie Harry well, and Sonny Bono. They're both aging musicians at yeah, this point, right? right? Debbie... Blondie started... 10 years prior. Sure. So Blondie is officially entering the classic rock phase. Yeah, I mean, it's 88 at this point, yeah. And Sonny Bono is long. Sonny Bono was thriving when these kids were dancing. Sure. Right? Shortly thereafter. And so we get these two aging musicians that are playing roles where they're trying to grasp onto the youth and support youth and pretend that they're still just as young and fun and vibrant as they were back you know when they were these kids age reminds me a little bit of when we saw mean girls you uh-huh. know, one girl's mother being really into wanting to be part of that sure. youthful generation yep it's one of uh one of actually several things that kind of make me think back to that mean girls show yeah and then also we have jerry stiller who i think uh is one of the funniest parts of hairspray just oh he's great because he dances and he's supportive and happy normally you get in john waters films you get these curmudgeon mean parents yeah right these these authority figures that don't respond well to the overall plot line of what's going on in a dirty shame it's obvious it's mm. the whole neuter group right but in polyester there's the you know it basically boils down to there are groups of people that are not okay with the taboos tackled in this particular right. film who are constantly clashing with the people who are perpetrating i guess the taboos our heroes yeah essentially and so it's really nice and refreshing to see jerry stiller as just a nice supportive male parent yeah he's funny he seems like a great guy yeah he's so incredibly positive uh except when he loses his silly putty set right that's, but aside from that sure then that's incredibly positive when we talked about the the herschel gordon lewis film uh-huh. um gorgo girls gorgo girls we did right uh, also, a strange Churchill Gordon Lewis note: John Waters appears in Blood Feast Two, uh-huh. which will have to happen on this show. But John Waters also appears in Seed of Chucky. Yeah, we get to see John Waters acting on double feature a little bit more than in his own films. But uh, my point in, in bringing up Herschel Gordon Lewis, I remember when we did the Gorgor Girls, there were uh, you know the feminists all kind of attack right. the fun of sure. the film. Yeah, they need to stomp in with their signs. Everybody's having way too good of a time. We need to bring in a bunch of characters to just fucking rain on the parade. Right. And we don't always have to do that. In Hairspray, we don't have to do that. Yeah. I mean, it never even really gets to the... I mean, eventually it comes to a head. Yeah. But the the negativity 
never manages to overwhelm the sense of joy and power. I mean, the beginning of the beginning of the '60s, right? Yeah. This movement towards what eventually becomes integration, racial integration. Yeah, right. But it's just you never. It never brings you down, and you never feel like they're an overwhelming. Yeah, amidst the giant hair jokes. Uh, and Mr. Davis not being able to see his geometry board, <laughs> and I guess all the the dancing too. There is the the root of this movie, the real core, the heavy problem is racism. Right. You know, it's uh, this is John Waters. I mean, his sole PG film. Right. And I love this film for uh, really helping the mainstream understand how I feel about John Waters. Yeah. I think the feeling that this movie gives everybody else is what it gives me to see any of his films right yeah no i totally agree that's why i watch a dirty shame so often sure yeah it's uh it's a fun it's a perfect world yeah a place you know you want to be and i think it would be so easy for me to hate it for that instead to say well this is the mainstream one this is the one everybody likes this is the tame one yeah right although you know five or six of them are the mainstream one Right. right it's true but yeah exactly what you're saying the tame one and instead, I completely embrace it for that. It makes it one of my favorites for that exact reason. Because now I'm no longer a crazy person. Mm-hmm. Now other people kind of get a little bit of a glimpse of how I can see a movie that's so really sick or deranged by, right. uh, by most people's you know opinion. Uh-huh. And if we lighten that up just a little bit, we're doing all the same it, things. Yeah, it's the same model. It's the same outline. You have the same basic I mean, we have components. our taboos, right? What, what yeah. are our taboos in this movie besides uh, big hair? Oh, well, we have dancing. Sure. Um, ra- well, racial integration. Sure. Uh, interracial relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, it's pretty much dancing in black people. Pretty that's, much dancing in black people, <laughs> that's yeah. That's what we're getting to. And, you know, there's there's a lot of scenes, too, that force people up against those taboos, much like the other John Waters stuff we've talked about, you know, where they go into the black neighborhood and we see that. Or Penny's mom uh, gets there and she's afraid. She's literally afraid of every black person right. she sees. Yeah. Regard, regardless of, you know, who are, regardless of who they are or what they're doing or mm-hmm. what they represent in that community. And I think everybody can get behind, you know, making fun of racism. That's, you know, not terribly difficult. But then we push it just a little bit more and move into interracial relationships. Right. Which is something that, I mean, I think there's people who still struggle with that idea today. I Yeah, no, I fully agree. Not a lot, but and, and 1988, I can only assume it would have been more. I still don't know if you would call it a taboo in 1988. Yeah, I don't either. But there's a lot of people who, you know, totally fine uh, getting past racism, Mm -hmm. but they're old enough that mixed race relationships kind of bother them. About this mixed race relationships thing, sorry, but I'm going to have to digress away from hairspray because I have a problem here. Uh Uh-oh. And it's not with mixed race (laughs) relationships. Oh, I was going to say we might need a little intervention here. The article that I remember reading about, um, it was an editorial, by the way. I don't want to give it any credit. Sure. It was an editorial, and I've, I've heard it quoted. Um, people I've talked to have brought it up. But it discusses how there was a little boy who was born to a white mother and an Asian father. Sure. And he needed a blood transfusion or an organ transplant. And how, because of his mixed race, they were unable to find him a match. Interesting. Regardless of whether or not that's true. Right. I don't believe it. I didn't check up on the science. <laughs> sure. I do not buy into it. So you mean that's your that's your gut uh, sure. gut instinct there. But the article then goes on to state this is why interracial relationships are dangerous. Wow. Because we are endangering the children. Wow. Anyway, I didn't mean to digress too far from the happy fun MTV dancing attitude. No, but I no, did want to bring that up because it does exist, and I feel like people should be aware. You mean MTV dance shows? Uh, yeah, I guess that's what I did mean. What? Uh, I mean, we saw this on a movie not too long ago. I think I think it was Big Lebowski. It might have been Sideways, though. Yeah, it was probably it was, that show, though. I was just thinking that. Um, they were, they were watching a TV with one of those Yo MTV Dance you, Beach. You Fat continued Beach House. to call. It, thank you. You continued to call it Fat Beach Dance Party. I don't. I don't know what it was. But it was something that happened on MTV where for about two hours, people would just dance on a boat uh-huh. or at a beach or wh- whatever the fuck I'm familiar with the idea, but 
never having cable. And that's kind of what the uh, the show here is. Yeah. It's just people dancing and everybody tunes in. Mm-hmm. And I don't understand. The, I play, don't know if anybody watched these. They play the top 10 songs, I guess. And I don't know. It seemed like a combination of Top of the Pops over in the UK. Sure. Okay. Shout out to our Cross the Pond homies. I could see that. And uh, the Mickey Mouse Club. Yeah, except on this show, it's only white people allowed. And they have... Um, except Thursdays. Except on Thursdays. Well, that's the weirdest thing, isn't it? It seems like this little pat on the back. Oh, good for you. You're giving Thursdays to the blacks. Way to go. Like, but no white fuck? people are allowed there. On <laughs> Seriously. Thursday. What the fuck? You know, this idea just makes me so nuts. It seems, uh, it seems incredibly bizarre, even modern day. And I don't know if this, this has ever bothered you. But the idea of, say... Racism? Yeah, that bothers me. I was going to say, like, Black History Month. Black History Month bothers the shit out of you me. You know what I mean? It seems like the last tinge of racism in a yeah. in a super PC society. Something about Black History Month specifically says, hey, we're going to go ahead and give you this. Yeah. It just seems like such a, a fucking shitty, like, it's insulting. It's, I'm offended by I, it. I'm totally in agreement with you about Black History Month. Not the song, the, uh, the actual time of year. For no reason at all, if black people want to send us their opinion of Black History Month, I'm kind of curious for sure. emails. Also, Double white people. Show at We're not going to discriminate. I was just thinking it would be easier if now everybody has to tell us what race they are when they email us, and that <laughs> no, just don't. sounds like a bad idea. <laughs> I'm colorblind, man. I don't see color in emails. I hate you. Uh, let's not focus on the hate. What I love in this movie is the excuses that people give. Yeah. You know, the kind of, I'm not racist. It's it's just a matter of economics. Right. It's just pure, simple yeah. facts. Come on now. I love black people. I just really like my rich white neighborhood. Yep. Fuck you. It reminds me now, I mean, we see that today in gay rights all mm-hmm. the time. Oh, yeah. I have plenty of gay friends. I just don't want them tainting well, marriage. The thing the thing that drives me nuts when, when we're getting into, you, you said the phrase gay friends. Mm -hmm. And I hate that because there's always people that go, I've got nothing against gays. I've got nothing against blacks. I have a black friend. (laughs) Right. You know? Oh, well, we'll check that box off. Yeah, exactly. Well, I guess you're in the clear. Sorry. It it seems like something, if you're going to be the type of person that speaks out about or speaks out or for black rights or gay rights, and you have to, you know, do that in public, it seems like before you do that, I need to make a black friend. Yeah, right. If I make a black friend, I instantly gain a lot more credibility. Yeah, that's how the other side defends themselves. Yeah, that's one of my best friends is black, right. so I mean, I can't be a racist. Black human shields. Yeah, that's, that's what it is. That's uh, terrible. A couple more small gems coming out of this film. Uh, one is Hefty Hideaway, which is Hefty one Hideaway. of my favorite things. There's nothing really analytical to say about Hefty Hideaway. It's just, uh, it's amazing. The commercial is amazing. Mm-hmm. Eating a cupcake in the was commercial. Was it a cupcake? I thought it was a snowball. It looked like some kind of fat cake. I don't know what it is. Which I think is uh, also called a snowball. Snowball? A snowball is... You're getting dangerous to that other dessert phrase you're not allowed to mention on the show. (laughs) I know. I know. But you know, do you know what a snowball is? If you fucking say snow cone... It's not. I'm not going to say it. uh, Yeah, that's when you spit cum into somebody else's mouth. Yeah. Or a cream-filled cake covered in marshmallow and then topped with shredded coconut. Same thing. That you ejaculate onto. Wow. Also, the Leslie Gore song, uh, You Don't Know Me, the one that's used in The Woods. Uh-huh. Um, it really, really fucking haunting there. Not here at all. Right. Having a blast here. Yep. It's a slow dance. Everybody's in love. Uh, Mink Stoll and the signs she holds yep. up are great, too. But there's one more really strange thing to come out of this. One more. And if, well, there's, there's plenty, I guess. But uh, it's something that if we could try and exercise our... The power of having an audience, uh-huh. however, which we uh, try really hard not to do, exploit at all times. Right? Yeah. Um, Donate dot double feature show dot com. If someone could send us an email, <laughs> Leslie Powers, Leslie Ann Powers, all right, plays uh, Penny. Okay. In in this film, who's permanently punished? Yeah. For a majority of the film, she has a giant P uh-huh. on her chest. Don't even give me that look. I know you have a joke in there. Just let it go. I'm just going to let it slide back down my throat. God damn it. Your throat? Yeah. Anyways, Leslie Powers was in one film that you may have seen. Uh, Was it called Hairspray? That's exactly the film. Only film she was ever in. Never had an acting career before that. Never had one after that. 
Uh, John Waters himself says on the commentary, believe me, I've been looking for <laughs> Leslie Powers because she's fun in this movie. Yeah. She's great. I mean, as great as any John Waters actor ever is. But yeah. she's Divine fun. is the acting standard for John yeah, Waters sure. forever. Sure. And, you know, we could say amazing things for an entire show about Divine. Yep. We seem to come up with amazing things to say about Divine on every goddamn show. We pretty show. much do that with any movie. Or ignore the actor. Mm-hmm. So we're not ignoring Divine. Uh, it must be awesome. must be totally awesome. I'm really enjoying Penny in this film. I think she's fucking hilarious. She's one of the main goddamn characters. Sure. Yeah. Can't find her anywhere. No but idea said, what happened to her. You said John Waters himself said. Oh, yeah. I never got back around to that, Sorry. did I? Yeah. I, my brain lasts about five seconds, my memory. What? John Waters himself yeah. Yeah, said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John Waters. Uh, doesn't know where she is. Really? Yeah. John Waters, who had scenes in the fucking movie with her, aside from directing her and all her other scenes, doesn't know whatever became of her, doesn't know where she went. Wow. Nobody knows where she is. Somebody, fi- If Leslie Powers listens to this show... If people actually just want to pretend to be Leslie Powers yeah. and send us emails. Sure. Or if anybody's a friend of Leslie Powers, if Leslie Powers is your yoga instructor. Take a picture of Leslie Powers and email it to us just so I can weed out all the people who are pretending to be Leslie Powers to amuse me from people who might actually know Leslie Powers. I just want to know where is she, what's she up to, what she's been doing. I need to get her in a movie with Felissa Rose. It's very important. Doesn't matter if you're black or white. How did you know the name of my film? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I just, spoilers. I thought spoilers. we were on to. I thought we were already on to a little shop of horrors. Yeah, I guess we already covered the ending of this movie during Serial Mom, so we don't <laughs> need to cover it again. Uh, let's just move right into Little Shop of Horrors. The Little Shop of Horrors. The Force. Little Shop of Horrors. Article. Very important. Very so, important. So I subtly mentioned moments ago the uh, the term <laughs> black and white, but I know that you have some uh, shocking information to anybody in our audience that. Watch the black and white version of The Little Shop of Horrors. I have shocking information for anybody who watched The Little Shop of Horrors this week. Okay. Turns out there's a color version of the film that you didn't watch. Huh. Again, use the email. Let me know <laughs> if I'm wrong. Nobody watched the colored version. It's out there. Well, uh, the film's I, in public domain. You're allowed to colorize anything in public domain sure, and then yes. sell it again. They did it with Reefer Madness, too. They did. Yeah, there's, uh, there's quite... We've never talked about colorizing black and white films. But while we're on our 300th black and white film from this year, yeah, don't know how that happened. Sorry about that. It's going to keep going. All right. So we're adding to our list of public domain films. Anybody can take this film, do anything they want with it. And a lot of times when a film is public domain, the way you sell it is by putting it out with a better picture quality, sound sure. quality, doing some kind or of Or in a giant 50 film box set. Most commonly, that's how you get away with it. Mm-hmm. In a giant 50 film box set. But The Little Shop of Horrors is a well-known film. It's got star power, man. It's yeah. got fucking... It has Jack Nicholson it, yeah. in it for about five minutes. So it's there's marketability there, right? Sure. Because you can put well, his face also, on the cover. Also, the magic of Little Shop of Horrors is that the original film, as we mentioned in the beginning, it's in public domain now. Yeah. And Roger Corman sold the rights. Yeah. So Little Shop of Horrors has turned into a giant cult thing. Right. Yet its original stem lies in the public's domain. You can't say stem when you're talking I'm about sorry. the little shop of horrors. Jesus. Yeah, so this almost gets into asylum territory. Right. Uh, that film company that makes you accidentally get things from Redbox. Uh-huh. You, um, you might accidentally watch this version of the little shop of horrors sure. instead of getting the, uh, the film Broadway adaptation thingy little With shop Rhea of Roman horrors. With Rhea Perlman and Rick Moranis. Right, that one. Steve Martin, also in that movie. Can't leave out Steve Martin. I for, I, it's been such a long time since I've seen that movie. Steve Martin. The step beyond remastering is this highly controversial thing called colorizing a film. Uh-huh. Uh, highly controversial to the point that uh, on that show where Ebert talks to some other guy who's uh, who gets recast every couple the seasons. The dead one? I don't know if it was the dead one. Doesn't matter. My point is uh, they did a kind of a special edition of Ebert and whatever. And uh, they equated it to vandalism. They huh. were they used some very strong words about it. Actually, huh. a strongly worded letter that they uh, they in red ink about colorizing and how it was vandalism. Wow, that's how it um, was akin to. I think ironically they may have used street graffiti because, as we all huh. know, there's no art to that. Yeah, thanks Ebert. Just like video games. So if something's in public domain, you're not. They don't think it's nice to colorize. What the fuck? Who cares? Well, that's my thought. Don't watch it in color. Right? 
we had no problem watching it in black and white. Really easy to find in black and white. Yeah, we didn't even really debate that. We went on Netflix, it had it in black and white. We watched it in black and white, done, done deal. That was rough. See, this is why we don't care about remakes and everybody else fucking flips a shit about remakes. Yeah. It doesn't destroy the original film. Original film, turns out, still there. Just yep. go ahead and watch it. Uh huh. Every time somebody else talks about the remake, Tell them something about the original film. Yeah. Be that fucking snobbish person who says not as good as the original. That's right. totally fine. That's, uh, uh, yeah, it's, that's really just the way to go. Bunch of people invite you over to watch a crappy remake. Get out your iPod. Start watching the original film on your Netflix right. app. This isn't difficult. Or if you really like the original film, uh, just make it again in two days. Yeah, and right. And sell it a second time. <laughs> right. <laughs> I believe that would then be called a remake. Uh-huh. Unless you give it a different title. So the process of colorization is kind of interesting and something that actually Double Feature has done. I uh-huh. don't know if you were aware of this. Or oh, not. I'm totally aware. I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, way back when, um, <laughs> now I don't think I ever talked about it. Way back when we did Leprechaun, uh-huh. the poster for Leprechaun blows. It's awful. Mm-hmm. So I recolorized it. Wow. I completely redid the thing from black and white. I basically brought it down to black and white huh. and then artificially re-fucking painted it because of how crappy it looked. And I thought, hey, while we were holding up the Leprechaun films, let's let's put out one good JPEG on the entire internet that people could use for the sake of Leprechaun. You presumptuous bastard. Subsequently ruining the entire Leprechaun franchise. I know. I didn't think that I would ruin the Leprechaun franchise by doing that, but as you'll notice, there have been no new Leprechaun movies since. Son of a bitch. So I did this single frame, and it turns out, uh, you know, when you're using something like uh, segmentation... That's basically the pro. There's more advanced computer processes for that now, but not really. You basically cut out all of the different little pieces and then you color them in. So somebody's hair is blonde. You cut that out. You're going to tint that blonde and then they have a blue coat on. So you cut out their coat and you do that with every single thing in the frame. Huh. Tell a computer kind of how to follow it and how to color it for you. It sounds like it's an insanely laborious process yeah. that is less art and more something they pay people in third world countries to do. Right. However, definitely not vandalism, you pretentious assholes. <laughs> All right, so uh, speaking of vandalizing a classic piece of art, uh-huh. I think this movie was made for about $5 in about an hour and a half. Yeah. Do you want to uh, shed some light on that yeah, subject? This film is actually made. It was made in two days. What happened? So Literally this two days. Not a joke. Exaggeration. Yeah. Hyperbole. Two right. days. Literally... 48 hours of time. So this film is is written, directed by Roger Corman. Great. We did uh, Roger Corman a little while ago. He produced Reform School Girls. Yeah. Um, I think we talked about him uh, producing Big Bird Cage and all those things, but I don't think we've ever gotten a Roger Corman directed picture on here. There was um, a tiny fleeting moment in this disaster called the Music Box Massacre. Uh-huh. Which, right, uh, okay. We talked about Bucket of Blood for about five seconds and yeah. didn't say anything about it. So Bucket of Blood was filmed the same week Great. as Little Shop of Great. Horrors. What happened is Corman goes out. Mm-hmm. Corman, first off, should be noted, very well known as being really good with his money. Yeah. Never spends money, always makes money, and he is just he's he's widely held as the beginner of independently produced films he's the beginning of independent filmmaking which i mean if we go back to the double feature idea of i've made a movie you haven't yeah. what do you know roger corman has oh plus a hundred on yeah, us exactly we have made zero films roger corman has made more films than most of the people barring maybe takashi Mike, who, right yeah. who might pass him sometime in his life yep i mean if you're gonna talk about perhaps not incredible films sure but man, this guy had, there are so many movies that exist in the world now because of Roger Corman yeah. that had there not been a Roger Corman would not exist. It's true. And the remakes and sequels and everything that have come out after that. You really want to get high and mighty about pieces of art. Yeah. Because of Roger Corman, there is more art in the universe. Absolutely. And so he sets out, he has the script ready and written for Bucket of Blood, which we talked about the Music Box Massacre. Great film. Really like Bucket of Blood. Raps shooting in five days, he has the studio rented for a week. Sure. All the sets rented for a week. Great. So about four days into shooting Bucket of Blood, he realizes we're going to finish early, assigns a scriptwriter to essentially, I shit you not, rewrite Bucket of Blood, but make it a funnier horror movie. Great. 
Great. And then for the next two days after they shoot, they rearrange some of the sets they have, hire on a few new leads for actors, and shoot Little Shop of Horrors. In two days, on the same sets, for a marginal, marginal budget. And, I mean, that's that's the basis of what has become this massive cult phenomenon that is Little Shop of Horrors. Yeah, I think this is what Studio Cheap looks like versus Independent Cheap. Right. Because with Studio Cheap, I mean, this movie doesn't necessarily look inexpensive. No. It kind of has a bit of that old Ed Wood thing going sure. on. Right. I mean, there's the uh, there's a scene right before Seymour gives his mother the uh, the tonic. Uh huh. Um, where the camera operator appears to stumble before moving yep. into that other room. Uh, you know, little things like that you can definitely pick up on. Seymour's mother, who, by the way, I love, for all the lines of dialogue that appear as if they're, they're either being fucked up or they were poorly written in uh-huh. the first place, no time to tell, two days on set, yep. that has been lost in the history. <laughs> His mom tells us that uh, her worst fear is being left to chiropractors and faith healers. Yeah. I fucking love that. Good call, movie chiropractors who of course you know along with faith healers have about an equal value in the medicinal field yeah uh neither is based on science they are both uh as real and valid science as say a talking plant maybe Uh even not so probably less likely it's less likely that anything will evolve uh into a beneficial medicinal situation yeah certainly healers and chiropractors whereas it's certainly plausible even in a minutia to assume that maybe someday plants will talk. Yeah, so faith healers rely on faith, and chiropractors rely on magical energy fields. No joke, look it up. And giant plants rely on blood. Yeah, so aside from the movie being goofy and the acting and stuff, the the visual component of the film, there are a lot of sets yep. that look like they, at the very least, they include a lot of props. Right. This isn't, oh, it was inexpensive to make, like, hard candies inexpensive to make because it takes place in one goddamn room or one apartment or whatever. This movie uh, is going all over the fucking place. And, you know, when you're a cheap studio film, you just steal other people's sets. Yeah, that's all it is. It's stolen sets. You just run around to other places where you can film. So, at some point, we have to talk about the talking plants. Yeah. Can we we discuss Junior for just a moment? Let's please discuss Junior. I never get over a talking plant. (laughs) Never. I never get over it. The plant fucking talks, and I mean, honestly, the best part of a talking plant is one that says nothing of any value ever. This plant can talk. What a great, incredible scientific breakthrough. Plant never fucking says anything. No. Everything that comes out of the plant's so-called mouth is a big waste of everyone's time. <laughs> it has 10 different ways to request food. That's what the plant yeah, knows how to do. That's pretty much what it is. And what it ends up becoming is a man-eating plant, not to be confused with Dick Miller, which is a man-eating plants. Wow. But it actually becomes... That's the man-eating chicken joke from earlier <laughs> on our show. That's I right. inadvertently stole a joke from... I guess they didn't even use that joke. They should have. Yeah. Well, I think it was implied. I, it's that an implied was, joke, that right? Was a, it was a wonderful <laughs> exercise in subtlety to not wow, point that out. Was. that I wasn't ready for this film to be that subtle. That, I just assumed they didn't get right, the joke they made. <laughs> right. Dick Miller's in the, in the film eating plants, eating flowers. Uh, Dick Miller, who is the lead in Bucket of Blood, also right. one of my favorite Corman Troop actors and later goes on to be a Joe Dante yeah. actor. We saw him in Gremlins and Small mm-hmm. Soldiers. Um, but... Yeah, he's he's the opposite. Yeah. He's eating plants, plants eating people, except the plants getting a lot bigger and becoming a lot more famous, and Dick's just enjoying his carnations. Plants also getting a lot fuzzier inside. That's true. There's a lot of fuzz. And, Good old fuzzy plant. And and my conjecture was maybe the uh prop doesn't look so good on the inside and they have to cover it up you're you say that's absolutely not the case no it looks wonderful inside it's a shame they had to cover it with extremely accurate plant fuzz <laughs> um this plan is terrifying let me tell you why this plant is the scariest monster we've seen in any movie you have to feed it or else it will talk to you <laughs> that is absolutely the only reason to feed this plant it's not going to chase you it's not going to follow you <laughs> it's not going to roll it down the, the street you. like some other kind of vegetable. It may hypnotize you, but as we also know, 
uh, hypnosis. Right. That is total bullshit. Just hitting them all. But the thing, the thing about hypnosis is, on a bad day, you may end up playing Flip the Rock. Oh, I was going to say, I, I hope you're not about to say on a bad day you might wind up locked in a bedroom with John Waters. No. Because that this is actually a hypnosis double feature. <laughs> yeah, the uh, getting hit with the wet rock game. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> this woman who I can only assume is a prostitute. It because seems I'm not like really she's sure a prostitute, else. but then it comes down to the point where she volunteers. Right. Right. She volunteer volunteers. means you don't get paid. Ask anybody who's ever volunteered for anything. Right. Um, Do you um, want to be an intern? This is yeah, what he's exactly. asking her. And, uh, and she gets hit with a wet rock and well, it's probably, it's the second <laughs> fucking funniest thing it, it in the is. movie. The first funniest thing is the stupid plant. <laughs> I mean, it just, it keeps shouting, feed me yep. over and over and it gets funnier every yeah. I don't know how it seems like they should be milking a gag, but the fact that it's not really a joke, that's just the only dialogue they have for the plants. Right. Some well, guy literally some chow. Well, yeah, that's it. Well, like I said, different ways to say feed uh-huh. me. Uh-huh. They uh they have a voice actor for this plant. What are his lines? Just shout feed me more and more angrily. Now you're a medium-sized plant. Shout feed me as if you were like relatively <laughs> relatively large. What if you were huge but stuffed with fuzz? Just go <laughs> ahead and shout feed me. You're very agitated, you're a little pissed, nobody's brought you any food, you don't have legs, Right. you can't get your own food, Right. it's not like people are wandering around inside you trying to find money sure. from the cash drawer, feed me. Amazing. Audrey Jr. though is not the only voice acting chops that show <laughs> up in Little Shop of Horrors. Well, so for the first half, there's a mystery narrator who yeah. we get introduced to. It's not um, for the first half. It's about halfway through the film that it starts. No, there's a there's a thing in the very beginning. Remember, there's one oh, line in the right. beginning. Oh, that's right. There's one line. And then there's just no voiceover for yeah. a while. And then halfway through the movie, this is how you tell a, a cheap, fast story. Sure. You just write in Narration. voiceover. It's one of Roger Corman's favorite, 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 favorite techniques. Uh, Shogun true. Assassin. Yeah. Perfect example. To edit it down for American audiences, I don't know, show some action, have some voiceover, perfect film. So we get an introduction to Joe Fink, who's apparently the, the He's narrator. one of the two detectives. So we're told. Well, And I love that uh, right before we see the characters, it's important that he points out he's going to be one of them. Yeah. So he gets really excited and he says, I'm an investigator. I'm Joe Fink. I'm, I'm Joe Fink. And then they show the scene. It's ridiculous. Well, they show two guys, and they never specify which one's Joe Fink. It was clearly written that neither of them were a descript right. character. Right. And it doesn't matter which is Joe yeah, Fink. Yeah, it doesn't. Roger at Corman all. doesn't know. Nobody right. has any idea. Yeah. So these detectives are barely in the film, but one of them is the storyteller, and that's one of the few times that we get taken out of Mushnik's flower shop into an office, but not the only time. So that we have an excuse. To introduce us to what the cover tells us is is the most important character, which is Jack Nicholson, uh, which I I believe uh, Wilbur is yeah. is his name, who is the weirdest fucking. He's the adorable masochist. The adorable masochist. Why is he in this film? What does his character have to do with anything? Essentially, uh, he walked on set and kind of did a ad lib of the character. Corman thought it was hilarious, wanted the film to be funny. Kind of let him play this character through the scene, wrote him in, and uh, the rest And is... added 10 minutes to the yeah. film. Exactly what... It... Hey, this this movie, it's 11 minutes short. What are we going to do? You, get over here. Yeah. You, guy who will be an easy writer. So in this dentist scene, uh, before Jack Nicholson even appears, they have to duel. Uh-huh. The dentist and the patient. Seriously, they have a, a sword fight with yeah. with dentist... Uh, with dentistry. dentistry tools. Yes, thank you. And then eventually the film ends in a giant yard of tires. Next week on Double Feature, did you have anything else to add? No, I really, I, as long as we're both smiling, that is the outcome that I think is necessary for Little Shop of Horrors. We have a website at doublefeatureshow.com where you can uh, learn about other directors. I think Roger Corman, I, I think he's going to show up there now because okay. I think... Music Box Massacre might count. I don't know. The system's actually automated. Okay. It's at the point where it nearly writes the summaries of directors Uh for us. Right. There still needs to be a little bit of human intervention there. Right. I'm done. I'm done with the show. We need to figure out what we're doing next time. How about we uh, get Pam Greer naked and watch Jack Hill direct her for two fucking features? Let's do Coffee and Foxy Brown. Oh, man. This is one of those uh, super bad for double feature to do. Super, super good 
to watch back to back. Yeah. Um, I haven't done one of those in a while, and it felt like time. Coffee and Foxy Brown, in that order, I uh-huh. believe, are movies that are linked. And we'll talk about the link next time. Sure. Sort of a sequel kind of don't really Not know thingy. That's... Watch more fucking film. Bye.